page 158, section 3-4, is rates of change in the natural and social sciences. So basically, now that we have learned derivatives, we want to see some of the ways that they apply in science. So we're going to look at applications to physics, applications to chemistry, applications to biology, to economics, that type of thing, and see how those um, two topics are linked together. So to begin with, over on page 159, we look at some applications to physics. Now, we've actually talked about this a little bit already because on 159 they start off with particle motion. Um, particle motion is a topic that AP loves because you can do particle motion all year long. There are some topics that we do that only apply to the derivative and they only apply to a specific um, section or two involving derivatives, but particle motion um, can be applicable to derivatives and integrals, which is what we do the second half of the year. And so AP loves that topic because they can test so many different concepts in one question. So very frequently it will show up as one of our six FRQs that we have a particle motion problem. Um, and so they tell me here on 159, if s equals f of t is the position function of a particle that is moving in a straight line, then change in s over change in t would represent the average velocity over a time period change in t, and velocity is equal to the rate of change of the position with respect to the time. And you could think of that at a particular instant in time, instantaneous velocity being the rate of change of displacement with respect to time at a particular instant. So that was the discussion that we had back in section 2, 6, and 3, 1. You might remember like we dropped a ball from the top of the CNN tower and we calculated how long it took it to hit the ground and how fast it was going when it hit the ground and that type of thing. And so at that point we talked about an instantaneous rate of change, an instantaneous velocity being the same thing as derivative. So example number one, it says the position of a particle is given by the equation s is equal to f of t, where um, our function is t cubed minus 6t squared plus 9t. And so the first thing that they say in A um, is that t is going to be measured in seconds and s is going to be measured in meters. It says A, find the velocity at time t. So we just want to leave t in there for time and not find it at a particular 5 seconds or 10 seconds or something. So we'll go through and find the velocity. Velocity, of course, is the same thing as derivative. And now that we have those shortcuts that we picked up yesterday, we can do more complicated derivatives that maybe we couldn't have done before. All right? So what would my velocity be? What would my derivative be? Perfect. 3t squared minus 12t plus 9. All right, then for b, it says, what's the velocity after 2 seconds? So how am I going to find that? Plug in 2. Right, so let's go through and just plug in 2. So that would be 3 times 2 squared minus 12 times 2 plus 9, and we'll get negative 3. Now, we mentioned when we did this before that we want to get in the habit of putting a label on our answers. And so when we're talking about velocity, it's the rate of change of the distance with respect to the time. So we could say our distance or our displacement was in meters and our time was in seconds. So we want to put meters over seconds, so negative 3 meters per second. All right, same idea for velocity after 4 seconds, right? We would just go through and plug in 4. And when we do, we get 9. And again, we also want to label that answer meters per second. All right, the next thing they ask me is, when is your particle at rest? If your particle's at rest, what's its velocity? Zero. Zero. So basically, they're just asking me when, at what time, find t, when your velocity is zero. So let's take that velocity equation that we created and set it equal to zero, and when we solve it, we'll be solving it for t. And that will tell me when the times that my particle is at rest. So I have a um, quadratic. 
So I could factor it or do quadratic formula if it wouldn't factor. And I find out that I get t equals 1 and t equals 3. At those two um, times, my particle is at rest. All right, then d, it says, when is the particle moving forward? That is in a positive direction. Now, for particle motion, your particle will move forward when the velocity is positive, and it will move backward when your velocity is negative. So basically, when they say, when is the particle moving forward, they're just asking you, when is your velocity positive? So I need to make a sign graph for velocity, right? I need to figure out when velocity is positive, and typically they'll also ask me when it's going backwards, so I can figure out when it's negative as well. So I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna make a sign chart for velocity. So I already know that at one and three, I'm at rest, that those are zeros, those are my critical numbers. And then I could pick a test point to figure out where it's positive and where it's negative. So I'm gonna use zero. What do I plug that into? Do I plug it back into the original function, the velocity function, what do I plug it back into? Velocity, right, because if I'm trying to find a sign graph for velocity, if I'm trying to figure out where velocity is positive and negative, I plug back into the velocity equation, exactly. So if I plug zero, that was our test point, if I take zero and I plug it into this velocity equation, I'm gonna get a positive nine, right? So at zero, my velocity is positive, Cross a single critical number, the sign changes. Cross a single critical number, the sign changes. Or you could test every interval, whichever you want to do. So they asked me, when is my velocity positive? When is that particle moving forward? And that would just be when t is greater than 3 and when t is less than 1. So here's what we know. We know that from negative infinity to 1, velocity was positive, so that means my particle's moving forward. From 1 to 3, my velocity was negative, so my particle is moving backwards. And from 3 to infinity, my particle is moving forward because velocity was positive. Now, we mentioned that AP loves particle motion, so I wanted to just remind you of, at this point, everything that we know about particle motion. And you could put this in your notes, but what would be a better idea, because like we said, we're going to use this all year long, what would be a better idea is to like have a separate sheet of paper with everything on it just about particle motion, so that that way you're not trying to flip back through notes trying to find it. So what we know so far is that S equals F of T is our position function. That tells me where my particle is at any given time. The derivative of that position function is velocity because that's telling me the rate of change of my position with respect to time. We also know that when the derivative equals zero, that means our velocity is equal to zero. That's when our particle would be stopped. It would be at rest. And when the velocity is positive, my particle is moving forward. When my velocity is negative, then my particle is moving backwards. Something else that we learned back in section 2.6 um, was that the absolute value of velocity is speed. Because you can have a negative velocity, as we've just seen, when your particle is moving backwards, its velocity is negative. But you can't go a negative 20 miles an hour your speed can't be negative. So you would have to take the absolute value of the velocity to get your speed, okay? So those are the things that we know about particle motion so far. So for E, it says draw a diagram to represent the motion of this particle. Okay, now think about this. In F, they're gonna ask me to trace it for five seconds. So while I'm drawing out a diagram of the motion of this particle, I'm gonna specifically look at the first five seconds. So I know so far that from zero to one, it was going forwards. From one to three, it was going backwards. And from three on, it was going forward. So that's what I wanna try and map out. I wanna try and map out from zero, time equals zero to time equals one, it's going forward. From time equals one to time equals three, it's going backwards. And then from time equals three to time equals five, it's going forward again. The problem is, 
I don't know how far forward and backward it's going. And so I can get that from its position function. I got these numbers 0, 1, 3, and 5 from our sine graph. Because if I'm analyzing this function from 0 to 5, I knew it was going forward 0 to 1, backwards 1 to 3, forward 3 to 5. So that's why I chose those numbers 0, 1, 3, 5. Okay? So let's go through and let's plug those times into the position function. Because if I do that, that'll tell me where my particle is at those particular times. So if I start by taking time is equal to zero and I plug zero in for the time in that position function, I find out that at time t equals zero, my particle is at zero. It did not have to start at the origin. It could have started anywhere. So I needed to check that. So, okay, when time is equal to zero, my particle is at a position of zero. All right, I know it goes forward for one second. So let's see how far it gets in one second. I'll take one and I'll plug it into my function. So one cubed minus six times one plus nine times one is gonna give me four. So it went forward four units in that one section. So I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna come forward to four so when time is equal to one second, my particle is at a position of four. Then I know it went backwards for three seconds, but it doesn't have to maintain a uniform velocity. So that doesn't mean that if it went forward four units in one second, that it has to go backwards eight units in the next two seconds. I need to use my position function to see, okay, when time is equal to three, after two more seconds has elapsed, where is this thing? So I'll take three and I'll plug it into my position function and I get zero. So that means that from time t equals one to time t equals three, it came all the way back to the origin. So it traveled four units in those two seconds. And then I know that it's gonna turn around and go forward again from three to five and then I just need to see where it is at t equals five. So let's take five and plug it in and I get 20. So for E, it says, find the total distance traveled by the particle during the first five seconds. Now, you could use common sense here if you wanted to, because you could say, okay, I went forward four, and then I went backwards four, so that's four more, that's eight, and then I went forward 20, so that's 28. So you literally could use logic and say, okay, from time equals zero to time equals one, it went forward four seconds, and then from time equals one to time equals three, it went backwards uh, four units in those two seconds. And then from time equals three to time equals five, it went forward 20 units in those two seconds. So you could add that up and get 28. If you're really more of a algebraic kind of formula person, you also could literally think of it as stopping point at one minus starting point at zero. So if you did that, you would say, okay, stopping point after one second was four and the starting point was zero, so four minus zero is four. Same idea here, stopping point at three seconds was zero, starting point at one second was four, so zero minus four is negative four, but of course the distance is never negative. So we would do absolute value of, the, of that to get our distance. And then stopping point after five seconds minus starting point at three seconds. So. You could use a formula approach if you prefer that as well. So that would be one application to physics. All right. Another application to physics is example number two. Now, AP loves to give us something that we have never seen before in our life and ask us to apply calculus to it. And that's what they're doing in these sections. You may be completely unfamiliar with linear density and chemical reactions and laminar flow and viscosity of blood flow and you know I don't know a lot about those things but I can still apply calculus to them and that's exactly what engineers do they take they don't necessarily have to be able to perform the things in the the field or in the factory that they're crunching the numbers to help that business find the best way to do um, and so in example number two, it says if a rod or a piece of wire is homogeneous, then its linear density is uniform as is defined as its mass per unit length. So its density is going to be its mass divided by its length. 
and it's measured in kilograms per meter. But suppose, however, you have a rod that is not homogeneous, that its mass measured from its left end point to a point x, as shown in the figure, could be given by an equation. I mean, if you think about it, all pieces of metal aren't the same thickness from one end to the other. There are a lot of things that need to be lighter on one end than they are on the other for the way that they need to be utilized, right? So that means their density is going to change as you move down that rod. So there's going to be a rate of change of the density with respect to your position, how many meters you've gone down that rod, right? And if you stopped and said, okay, when I'm exactly two meters down this pole, what is the density? That would be the instantaneous rate of change of the density at that exact spot. So when we calculate that, when our density is not homogeneous and it's changing and we're looking for an instantaneous rate of change, that of course would be derivative, instantaneous rate of change, and that's called the linear density. And you'll see that as a bold print term there. The linear density, and they're going to uh, represent it here, the linear density is the limit of the average densities. It's the rate of change of the mass with respect to the length. So we could say the rate of change of the mass with respect to the length, and that would be a derivative. Now, they're going to have to give you the equation that they want you to work with. So in our example, it says, uh, for instance, if mass f of x is equal to the square root of x, then what is the linear density when x is equal to 1? So basically what I need to know is when they say find linear density, they mean find the derivative. Just like when they say find the velocity, I know that means find the derivative. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to take this equation and take the derivative of it. Now, it would be a whole lot easier if I wrote it in exponential form, right? So I could do power rule. So what would the derivative of x to the 1 half be? Yeah, 1 half x to the negative 1 half. And then I want to find that at the instant when x is equal to 1. So I'm just going to plug 1 in. And when I plug 1 in for x, I get 1 half. That would be the rate of change of the density. So it is the rate of change of the mass with respect to the length. So if it is mass over length, then when I label my answer, my answer needs to be mass over length. And mass was in kilograms and length was in meters. Now, I also could kind of double check myself by using the average density. I mean, I just found the density at a particular instant in time. But I also could find an average density over an interval. Like if they said, find the average density uh, between 1 and 1.2. That's like y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? I could go through and I could say, okay, I want f of 1.2 minus f of 1 over 1.2 minus 1. It's just the change in y over the change in x. In this case, the change in mass because I'm plugging in to my formula that's finding mass. So that would be the change in mass over the change in length. So if I go through and I say, okay, let's find f of 1.2. That means put 1.2 in the place of x of the function. That would be the square root of 1.2. And then f of 1 means put 1 in the place of x in the function. So that would just be the square root of 1. And then 1.2 minus 1 is 0.2. If I throw that in, I get 0.48. That makes sense then that if the rate of change on average over this small unit, you know, 0.2 units long, is 0.48, it makes sense then that the answer I'm getting down here is 0.5 at the instant when x equals 1. So it just kind of gives me a way to make sure my answer is logical. If, however, I had gotten something like 17 over here and negative 2 over here, uh, something's not right with that, right? All right, then over on um, page 161, example 3, they talk to us about um, average current as another application in physics. Uh, we could think of the average current as the change in Q, the net charge that is passed through the surface during a time period change in T. So the average current during a time interval would be change in Q over change in T. 
And if we wanted to um, look at that at a particular instant in time, that would be an instantaneous rate of change, and so we could think of that as a derivative. Uh, so velocity, density, current are not the only rates of change that are important in physics. Uh, some other examples would be power, the rate at which work is done, uh, the rate of heat flow, temperature gradient, which is the rate of change of temperature with respect to position, rate of decay of a radioactive substance in nuclear physics. I mean, we could just go on and on and on with example after example after example of where we could apply derivative rate of change to this branch of science. All right, next one they mention is chemistry. And they say uh, chemists are more interested in an instantaneous rate of reaction. And we could find that by looking at the limit of an average rate of a reaction over a particular time interval. And then again, you could find an instantaneous rate of reaction at a particular instant in time. And that would be an idea of derivative. Um, over on page 162, they give us another example from chemistry. It's called isothermal compressibility. And this is one of the quantities of interest in thermodynamics is compressibility. If a given substance is kept at a constant temperature, <laughs> then its volume depends on its pressure P. We can consider the rate of change of the volume with respect to the pressure. And so that would be the derivative rate of change of volume with respect to the pressure. Um, as P increases, V is going to decrease. So that derivative is going to be a negative quantity. And the compressibility is defined by introducing a minus sign and dividing the derivative by the volume. So AP would give you a scenario like isothermal compressibility, and they would give you the formula for finding isothermal compressibility. So when it came to our test, of course, I would give you that formula as well. I would say this is the formula for isothermal compressibility, okay? Then they are also going to have to give you a formula for V. See how this has a V in here and a derivative of V in here? They're going to give you the formula for V as well. They would give you the formula for the volume. And then they would tell you the instant that they want you to evaluate that. In this case, they ask us, find the um, isothermal compressibility when volume is equal to 5.3 over P at the instant when pressure is equal to 50. Okay. So they would give me kind of a description of what it was I was finding. They would give me the formula that they uh, wanted me uh, for the thing they wanted me to find. And then if there were any components in that that I needed, like in this case I need volume to be able to complete this, they would give me a formula for that and they would give me the instant when they wanted me to calculate it. So we, they want me to calculate it when pressure is equal to 50. Here's what I would have to do. I would have to follow that random formula that I've never seen before and apply calculus to it. So I would come up here and say, okay, I'm going to need V at the instant when the pressure is equal to 50, and I'm going to need the derivative of V at the instant when the pressure is equal to 50. So let's find both of those things, right? So if this is what they gave me for V, I would first rewrite it so that I could use power rule, right? So if I go through and take the derivative, I'm going to have negative 1 out in front, so negative 1, 5.3p to the negative 2. If you'd rather move that back down to the denominator so that you don't have a negative exponent, that's fine as well. Then I could go through and I could throw 50 into that derivative that I just found in the place of p. So if I throw 50 in the place of p, then that is the derivative when the pressure is equal to 50. So go back to what they asked me to find, isothermal compressibility. That would be negative 1 over V times the derivative of V. So negative 1 over V. The formula they gave me for V was 5.3 over P. Okay, so 5.3 over P, and they told me that P is 50. Multiply that by the derivative at 50. That's what we just calculated right here. Throw that in my calculator, and I've got 0.02. So I've applied calculus to a, a concept that I've not seen before, but I can still do the math associated with it. Okay? All right, so here is our homework for tonight. Just a couple of these because, of course, they're, they're pretty involved and time-consuming. 